Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider, our weekly show here on condo living and association living, kind of designed for board members and for owners who live in condos to try to help you understand the industry. I think this show came about a couple of years ago. We've done about 175 shows, I think. It came about a couple of years ago because the legislature felt that there wasn't enough outreach to boards and owners on education. So we have a group of hosts. We have Jane Sugimura, the president of the Hawaii Council Community Associations, myself and Jonathan Billings, who take turns doing a show, trying to educate owners and board members in various parts of uh, mostly condominium living. And today our show is about association insurance. I've been teaching some continuing education courses for real estate agents on a topic called condo governance. Uh, and part of that is uh, insurance. And it's probably in my three hour class, the area that gets the most attention and the most questions. So I thought a nice review of the various types of policies, the things you should look for and the things you should be concerned about might be uh, a helpful reminder to all of you out there on how it works. That being said, I want to tell you that, you know, come 2021, everybody in these uh, high ride buildings over 10 stories are supposed to have completed their life safety evaluation, which may determine they need sprinklers or don't need sprinklers. Uh, there's a lot of TV commercials on both the radio and on television uh, saying, please tell your board to prove sprinklers. And this life safety evaluation, which is mandated under the city ordinance, has to be completed by May of 2021. Otherwise, I don't know what they're gonna do. I don't think there's much enforcement in the, in the ordinance, but I, I guess they, they'll get mad at us one way or another. But, uh, but the reality of it is that date's quickly approaching. But I wanted to share with you that obviously COVID has affected the ability to get engineers out there to do life safety evaluations. And the number of buildings makes it almost you have to stand in line to get it done. That there was a bill introduced by Carol Fukunaga last week extending all of the deadlines by one year. And it hasn't got a hearing yet, but when it does, we'll be notifying all of you asking to send in testimony and support. Uh, we're just not ready to uh, undertake that. I mean, to be honest with you, I have a hard time getting people out there because of COVID, uh, but then we don't really know the effect on maintenance fees and income and delinquent owners right now. Uh, because uh, we're still early in this COVID crisis. And so where's the money going to come from? They're saying, go borrow the money. Well, if you're already struggling because you have people who can't pay because they, they can't afford the maintenance fees because they have out of work, for example, this may not be the best time to uh, deal with that issue. But I just want to let everybody know that bill was introduced and we'll be notifying all of you as time goes on that uh, uh, please send in written testimony to the city council in support of adding another year on all these deadlines. It, it only makes sense, but I'm not sure when I talk about making sense that government makes sense the same way I make sense. I've, I have deep reservations that they think the same way normal people think. But either way, uh, that's just a little notice for all of you to know. So let's talk about insurance for a second. You know, there's really basically five types of insurance associations have to have. And it's in the statute, the condominium 514B. You know, some parts to that you may not be aware of. Now, granted, there are other types of insurance to the extent you can buy endorsements to include other acts and perils and losses. Uh, example would be earthquake. You know, that's a property insurance, but it's not traditionally found in, um, property insurance policies for condominiums, primarily because uh, we're not deemed an earthquake threat. When they give you these numbers and data and statistics of, of your threat level, uh, other than the big island, which has a low threat level, but has a higher threat level than all the other islands, you just don't see people buying earthquake insurance. It's very expensive. And we just aren't deemed to uh, be a severe risk for a catastrophic a catastrophic event through an earthquake. So there are other types of insurance we're not going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about the five main types of insurance. 
And so let's begin with property insurance. And what I want to say about property insurance, one of the most misunderstood things is you buy property insurance to cover perils. What is a peril? Hurricanes a peril? Fires a peril? A flood's a peril? A windstorm's a peril? But poor maintenance is not a peril. You're not covered for you failing to maintain your roof in an adequate time and the failure to just maintain your property. You don't buy insurance for maintenance. Well, I guess there's maintenance policies out there somewhere, but uh, I haven't seen any for condos. You're covering perils when you buy a policy. And when you buy a policy, you're buying a policy for property, the building as built. So if you've made improvements to your building and or your apartment, when the insurance policy evaluates your claim, they're gonna look at the original as built conditions. So if for example, an owner decided to put a luxurious color cabinets in their kitchen or wood floors at more expense than the carpet they got when they bought there, those upgrades are not included in your insurance unless you name them on your property policy, either the association's policy or in the case if it's a unit improvement on your HO6 unit policy. Otherwise, you're only covered to the extent of as built. And by that, you know, you have to understand that uh, when you buy your HO6 policy, many people add on the the various things that uh, they need to to have with respect to that. Now, I'm going to get more into HO6 policies uh, shortly. And the other thing the statute says, two things very misunderstood. The first is you must insure for replacement costs. Well, by replacement costs, obviously it costs more to replace the building today or the parts of the building today than it did when you built the building. So replacement costs is what it costs in today's modern terms in 2020 to replace your building. But the question often comes up what if the building code has changed and I can't replace what I had before? Well, hopefully your agent and you and the board were smart enough to buy building ordinance coverage so that you have coverage for having to repair or replace something due to a peril that is not available as originally built and you have to meet the current building code. A fire alarm system is an excellent example of that. You couldn't replace your current fire alarm system. And the cost to replace a new fire alarm system with all the requirements of the new fire alarm system is substantially more than cost to replace just the panel and bell system, which you couldn't replace anyway because it doesn't meet the building code. So you've got to make sure when you look at the coverage, you should always meet with your insurance agent and go through all your coverages to make sure you understand well, you're covered for perils and you have to insure for replacement costs. So some of you may say, well, I know I'm going to beat that thing because insurance costs go up every year. I'm just going to say the building is only $20 million and I'm only going to insure for $20 million. And if we happen to have a major peril and the whole building is wiped out, we'll just assess the owners. The problem with that is there's a provision in the policy called co-insurance. That is to say, if you should have insured the building for $30 million, but you only insured it to 20 million, thinking the first 20 million would go to you and you'll do deal with the amount extra necessary to fix it, you're gonna find a provision in your policy called co-insurance. If you haven't insured the building for replacement costs, the correct amount, and so let's say it was $30 million you should have insured it for, you insured it for 20, you insured it for two thirds of the value your 20 million you think you have coverage for, you only have two thirds of that or about $14 million in coverage. They're gonna penalize you for not insuring the building for the full amount that you should have under the statute, the replacement cost. And that's important because, you know, if all of a sudden you insured for the wrong amount and you don't have enough money, the owners are probably gonna be hoo-hoo and they're probably gonna sue the board for your breach of your duty, fiduciary duty, 
for not insuring per replacement cost per the law. And I'm going to come back to that DNO issue. Uh, we talked about DNO insurance, but you've got to make sure that you adequately insure the building for replacement cost. How do you get that number? Well, certainly you could go get an appraisal, and that's one thing you could do. And you could say, this is what the appraiser said. But if you rely on your insurance agent and the insurance adjuster to set the values, and they set the values and said the building is 20 million or 25, whatever it may be, you're pretty safe because they've told you what to insure it for. So you can certainly ask questions and you certainly should ask questions, but you wanna be careful to intentionally underinsure the building thinking that you're gonna be safe because you're never gonna have a full loss of the entire building. So you're insuring it for the total loss it's never going to happen. So you're insured for less, figuring the first money paid will cover the loss when, in fact, you may be under the co-insurance provision of the policy and you don't have the coverage you think you have. The second part of the statute, which is unique in condo world, is that that property insurance mandates that all water claims are covered under the master policy. Let me say that again. All water claims are covered under the master policy, whether it's the unit owner's fault, whether it's the unit owner's pipe, regardless of what it is, the primary carrier, the primary coverage will always be with the master policy, the association, subject to their deductibles, which we'll get into in a minute. But, you know, I get these questions all the time. I left some laundry in the sink, I left the water running, it overflowed. It's association claim. You know, my ice maker broke or my line to my washer broke. It's an association claim. And you have to notify your insurance agent of that claim, realizing the deductible will come into play. <coughs> realizing that your insurance company may subrogate against your HO6 policy. But either way, you always want to put your association carrier on notice. And what's interesting about that is that you have a deductible. And because we're going into the break and I want to talk about this deductible more in detail, I'm going to take the break and come back to the deductibles in one minute. So we'll be right back with Condo Insider talking about association insurance. Welcome back to Condo Insider. We're talking about insurance. We were on deductibles. And what I was saying was that over time, I remember the old day, I've been in the industry 25 years. In the old days, the association would have a $1,000 or a $2,000 deductible for water claims. But now they're running twenty and $30,000 for water claims because the insurance companies who insure the building realize they're, they're going to have water claims and the older the building, the more claims they're going to have. So they've really jacked up the rates. And so the only defense the uh, board had or the association had was to increase the deductibles to 20, 30, $50,000. And so what happens is the boards require you to have an HO6 policy and the association's deductible is covered under the HO6 policy. And believe it or not, that's a lot cheaper than the association insuring a low deductible because there's so many carriers out there servicing the HO6 market, the risk is spread in a much, a large, much larger number of insurers than on the property insurance. So uh, you want to have an HO6 policy because the board has a right under the statute to assess the deductible to whoever they think is appropriate. Maybe you because the damage came from you. 
maybe three owners because they don't know which of the three owners is really responsible. And it may be more than that, but the board under the statute has the unilateral right to determine how the deductible is going to be assessed. Think of it this way, you pay maintenance fees to have insurance. So you're entitled because you pay maintenance fees to all the benefits of that policy, which includes water claims. So to the extent you have a major water claim, you're gonna be entitled to have that protection under the master policy. But a lot of them do fall under the deductible, so it's gonna fall back on your HO6 policy. Flood insurance is like rising water, wind-driven rain, like in a hurricane, is a different type of water claim. So if you have flood insurance, you're in a flood zone, you have rising tides, you have to buy flood insurance through national flood as an additional policy. You have to buy it for the full replacement value, even though rising tides or rising water is unlikely to get to the 33rd story. And if it does, you better build an ark. You know, but the reality of it is, um, uh, you have to have flood insurance, you have to insure the whole building and you have to be in a, in a, in a flood zone to have it, but uh, don't think you're doing yourself a favor if you don't have it because the insurance company won't cover. They're able to tell whether it's a rising tide or wind driven rain when they uh, take care of a policy and a claim. Final comment on property insurance that people don't realize. You take any insurance company, first insurance, you name it, and they insure your building for $20 million. Of course, they've insured lots of buildings. They go to the market and they buy from another insurance company called reinsurance. So they'll take that $20 million risk and they may buy $15 million of insurance from a reinsurance company saying that if we have a big $20 million claim, I want you to insure me for 15 million of it. Well, that reinsurance is a national program, national companies, huge companies. So you can bet that all these fires in California and Oregon all these water damage and hurricanes in, in the Gulf are going to affect premiums in the future. It's not just our experience in Hawaii. You can bet that all those catastrophes we have currently on the mainland are gonna ultimately affect your insurance premiums. So let's move on to general liability. Someone gets hurt on the property, you know, and you have to have general liability insurance. Most people buy around $2 million for general liability insurance. Uh, but that's just something you need to look at the size of your association. It's, it's fairly cheap insurance. Uh, the big number, the big elephant in the room is the property insurance. Uh, general liability insurance is going to be a couple to a few thousand dollars a year. And you ought to look at how much general liability insurance you have and make a decision because uh, everybody wants more. So you don't see small claims anymore. You see everybody wanting five, 10, 20 million dollars. So uh, you want to make sure you have adequate general liability insurance uh, for injury. The statute also requires you, the board, to buy something called a crime policy or a fidelity bond. It's about $1,000 a year. What's interesting, that policy covers your association for any theft by an employee or the board of directors or a committee of the board of directors, someone using association funds. And it's a very inexpensive policy. It has limits, so the amount of, you, you buy the policy for will have, have an effect on, on the premium, but you have to have it by law. But ask yourself this question. What if someone breaks into my resident manager's computer, is able to go to my online banking and steals $500,000 from our association account? A cyber theft. Is that covered? No, it's not not unless you have bought the endorsement for cyber theft insurance, you know, and that's to me a bigger risk than the board ceiling. And the, you know, associations don't have much money anyway, but someone being able to go in and tackle your reserves and st steal your operating account money is a bigger threat to me in this world of cyber theft. So you got to make sure you have the cyber theft coverage as a part of your endorsement on your crime policy. It's about 200 bucks a year, by the way, it's not exactly, over the top, but if you don't have it, and there have been associations in Hawaii that have lost two or 300,000. And yeah, they make a claim against the bank and say it's the bank's fault. But wouldn't you rather for 200 bucks know your, your association funds are safe? And so you, you wanna make sure you're, you're covered on that. Now the next policy which you have to have, the fourth of the five, is director, officer, and liability. And that's an interesting policy because you know Hawaii has the highest rate of claim in the United States. You can bet 
that your DNO policy premiums will go up over the next one or two years, 20 to 50%. We lead the nation on, on claims against directors and officers on liability claims. And that includes everything from uh, retaliation to civil rights commission, you name it, if an owner doesn't like what you did, they file a, a complaint against you or a lawsuit against you, and the insurance company has to uh, hire a lawyer to defend you. Now, what's interesting about that policy, you may think you're insured. Well, you're insured for defense, but you may not be insured for the act itself. If the act is, for example, willful intent on part of the board, you intentionally ignored the condominium law 514B or gross negligence, that it's not just simple negligence. You can see that if the stairs aren't repaired, they're gonna collapse and kill someone and you do nothing about it and they collapse and kill someone. So it's considered gross negligence. You as a board member may not be covered for the actual peril itself. The way you protect yourself is to do what the business judgment rule says, which your fiduciary obligations are, and, and don't commit gross negligence or, or willful intent. I see that argument made all the time against boards with respect to um, these DNO claims, which are just going over the top and through the roof, the number of claims that I, that I see. And I saw a claim the other day where the, they said the board needed a owner approval to, to make a pool upgrade. And they want the board itself to repay all the money back to the reserves because they didn't have owner approval. Well, I guess the easy thing to do is to go out and get owner approval, but uh, after the fact. But uh, the, the reality of it is, is an argument as far as the interpretation that the board has an obligation to repair the property. And if they, they need to repair it and they spend the money to repair it, can they be held responsible? Well, they've increased it and put a better quality tile in. And they get all these arguments by people. And so one out of 56 owners are arguing that they want the board to refund the $150,000 spent on repairing the pool. And that's currently in litigation right now. So I don't know the result, what's gonna happen, but uh, you wanna be careful in these DNO claims. And what I'd say to you up front is don't let the claim become a claim. You have all sorts of um, opportunities of dispute resolution through uh, the, the current law with regard to a value to mediation, arbitration. If you have a problem with the owner, deal with it head on and try to get it into that $175 real estate commission subsidized mediation program, you know, and, and try to avoid these claims becoming claims because if it goes the way we're going, there's gonna be at some point in time, carriers won't write insurance in Hawaii because of the fact there's just been way too many claims. The fifth and final policy is called an umbrella. An umbrella is kind of a policy that's over and top your other policies. So if you buy a $10 million umbrella and you have a 2 million general liability policy, you have $12 million in coverage, 2 million from the primary carrier, the general liability, which is the most expensive and 10 million from the umbrella carrier, which is the least expensive. And so what I tell people all the time is, don't put all your limit of liability in the general liability policy because it's going to go to that one carrier and the rates are going to be much higher than if you split it and get the base core covered under the uh, general liability policy. And then what you do is buy an umbrella for the excess coverage on, on the rest of that policy. And then you're in the best situation policy, which leads me briefly into the HO6 policy. And the HO6 policy is basically gonna cover the deductibles. And I wanna remind you, if you have fancy improvements in your unit, that you have to uh, add those and include those in your HO6 policy. Now I do some rental property and I have an HO6 policy. And what was important to me to have lost income, should we have a hurricane or whatever, and I don't have the income anymore for my tenant, and in some cases, vacation rental property, legal vacation rental property, um, you're going to be lost of any income and not have any after the hurricane, theoretically, because you haven't bought business loss coverage. And not all insurance companies write business interruption for vacation rentals. Some do, some don't. But you have to declare an amount of how much money a year you get uh, in that. And then you pay a premium for that. But, you know, I have my HO6 policies. I have some enhancements where I added split air conditioning and things on that line I had to add to the policy. And I have vacation rentals and our rentals. 
Well, the cost for me to add 60,000 a year in lost rental income was about 200 bucks. And I have five properties. And it's worth the thousand dollars a year to cover the five properties in case something goes wrong. Because when you start looking at insurance, you're gonna get the coverage as written in the policy. And that may not be everything you think is covered with regard to, to, to insurance. So um, I'm hoping that's helpful. Finally, there's the HO4 policy, not required by anybody. HO6 should be required by the board for you to have one. And the board can buy one if you don't buy one and charge you back for it, is the HO4 policy, which is a tennis policy. And some landlords require their tenants to have an HO4 policy to cover liability and things. Uh, most tenants I know don't require, require that, but um, um, that's another form of policy. So the bottom line in all of this is take insurance seriously. Make sure you understand what you have coverage for and you don't have coverage for. And then decide if you're willing to spend the money to get the coverage for some of the areas you don't have coverage for. And the best way to do that is annually meet with your insurance agent, go through your policy, have them explain what's covered and not covered. You know, I know the one property I own has pays like, $30 a year for terrorist coverage. So if a terrorist crashes their plane into the building, we have coverage where you don't have coverage if you don't have terrorist coverage. You should know all these things as a board member and as an owner so you can properly protect your investment. And that's kind of my short summary of insurance in condo world. So I hope you learned something from it or got your little mind thinking about these things. So when you annually renew your insurance policy, it's just not a matter approved. You ask questions and seek out what you have and don't have. And same with the owners, making sure if you have a policy, it's protecting you for what the association doesn't have. And on that note, I'm gonna say aloha and I hope you enjoyed Condo Insider. And we look forward to seeing you next week and bringing you another wonderful show on condo living in Hawaii. Aloha. <music>